uh, the recording started here. So welcome back, everybody. Happy Thursday to you. Yes, thank you. It is my birthday today, and I am celebrating by talking about alternative covariance structures, as one does. Um, although I did want to share with uh, my students the presents that I received this morning. So um, I don't know if, did, did Jonathan tell you about what he got for me? Did anybody know about this? Okay, so he has been listening to me talk about this idea of merch from my YouTube channel, and he made me a t-shirt. Let me see if I can drag it over here so you can see it. It says, Happy Garbage Day on the front, lisahoffman.com on the back. So you've seen it here, our limited edition t-shirt. And the back story is that this is a long sleeve t-shirt because I've been wearing the ones that I've worn since high school. And at this point, not only can they drink, vote, and rent a car, but like they're starting to become grandparents. So it's time to get some new, some new rotation into uh, the mix here. The other thing that I thought was funny is that my son, who is in the second grade, he is seven, made me a card. And the theme of the card, by the way, is that everybody in our house is doing all the things that mommy likes to do on her birthday. So here's Huey sleeping, because he knows I like to sleep. Here's me watching my TV in my big chair, and then daddy's going for a run. So the caption is, happy birthday, all of us. Oh. So <laughs> love, Hugh. So I thought that was uh, pretty clever, but I'm happy to be here. It's not garbage day, but somewhere on earth it is. I can guarantee that. The neighborhood that I ran through this morning, it was garbage day. So the, 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 the sentiment of happy garbage day, which I think of as like, make every day a happy day, right? So I've got merch. It's only fitting since uh, the domain name was actually a birthday present from about 10 years ago. So we're continuing the tradition. Anywho. We are, uh, we're going to have some fun here today, as one does. we got one more Zoomer coming in. All right. Okay, Zoomers, can you see my screen and hear me and everything? We good? Can you do a sound check on that? Thumb check? We're good on that. All right. Everyone else can hear, see me, hear me, etc. We're ready to roll. All right. So I put up this picture to remind us, what are we talking about this week? What do you remember from last time? As usual, I will take words, gestures, letters, phrases, anything. Variant structures. What are they for? What kind of longitudinal data? Yeah, fluctuating kind. So the, the, there is a continuum of how I think about the role of time in these sorts of models, where on the left-hand side is where time is the whole point where you're trying to observe with in-person change, heading over towards the right-hand side where time is somewhat irrelevant, but we still have to pay attention to how it affects the structure of the variances and covariances and outcomes. So yes, we're on the fluctuation side this week. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're trying to figure out how to best approximate the different variances across occasions and potentially different covariances. So I presented you with a menu of choices last time. Uh, here's two. What are these two? Feel free to read from the screen. This is my birthday present, as I want you all to talk to me, or type to me, as it were. What are the first two that we learned about that are in front of me? Yeah, unstructured. And what's good about unstructured? It always fits. You cannot be wrong. It literally is reproducing the data or the data, if you have missing data, under an assumption of missing at random, which means conditional on the data that you do have. Um, so yeah, if, if you only have a couple of occasions and you have balanced data, go with that and ignore the rest of what I have to say. But where does it fall apart? When is unstructured not a choice? When we have more than five or six outcomes. Yeah, once you get it into a lot of outcomes, or if people don't cooperate, and by, by that, what do I mean? Balanced. Yeah, unbalanced. If they don't come exactly when they're supposed to. Or you don't have control, and you're just trying to get whatever data you can, which is often the case in the real world. So unstructured is the right answer in terms of what the pattern is that we're trying to approximate with a model, but we can't always have it. So even when it is possible, it is advantageous from a power perspective to try to find something that has fewer parameters 
but fits as well. So if that is the most bestest fitting by minus two log likelihood, by the way, not by AIC and BIC, cough, cough, homework question, uh, what's the worstest fitting that we would entertain for longitudinal data? Over here. Yeah, compound symmetry, otherwise known as random intercept only, otherwise known as univariate repeated measures ANOVA. And no matter how many occasions, how many parameters make up that pattern? Two. So this is the one that tries to approximate covariance across occasions using a random intercept variance. It's the idea that the reason there is any covariance is because some people have higher means than others. Once you account for that, the E's are supposed to have constant variance and be independent. Uh, what kind of growth, individual differences in growth, would this pattern predict? Uh, not linear, necessarily. Parallel, the same, is the answer, yes. So these are variant structures. We don't know if it's linear or not because that's on the mean side. So the saturated means can take on whatever pattern the data wants them to have. The question is, how do we describe the variability that's left? And this is a parallel change model. It assumes that everybody follows whatever the mean structure says they do. So we're looking for stuff in between here, something that has fewer parameters than unstructured but hopefully fits reasonably well. Uh, what are some of the choices you remember from last time? Autoregressive. Auto that one, we'll go to that slide so we can look at it together. That one has how many parameters, no matter how many occasions? Still two. How does it differ from compound symmetry, though? Instead of the random intercept, we use local correlation on index. Yeah. So this is, makes a different statement about the reason for covariance. It's not adjusting for constant mean differences. They're not in this model at all. It says occasions that are one unit in time apart are correlated R. Occasions that are two units in time apart are correlated R square. Three units in time is R to the third, R to the fourth, etc. So the R is responsible for the correlation pattern. And why did I say that this one I've never seen fit real data? What happens to the predicted correlation as time gets further and further apart? Yeah, it decays. It decays too fast in most cases. Usually there is a sizable correlation at any time lag just because the data came from the same person, just because some people are higher than others on average. Uh, what if we do ARH instead? What does that change? The pattern of correlation or the pattern of variance? Variance. Instead of having, according to this picture, we've got four occasions, since it's a four by four matrix that's being shown as an example, we would have four variances instead of one. And how would I know if that fits better? If I need all four, what would I do? Ratio yep, likelihood ratio test. And a uh, question from the chat are these R core or R matrices? These are R. So this is showing the predicted covariance that results from that correlation coefficient. So R is the variance covariance version, R core is the correlation version, and these are the R versions. Um, all of the versions are in chapter four of the textbook somewhere. There's a couple of ginormous tables that have all of them in there for the example data set that I used for that. That's a different data set than I'm using in class, by the way. So yeah, any time that we have a question about what goes in our variance model, that's a likelihood ratio test, broadly construed. So we take the minus two log likelihood from the model that has fewer parameters, subtract from it the minus two log likelihood from the model that has more parameters and look at the difference. And we treat the difference as a chi-square test statistic with degrees of freedom equal to the number of parameters different. So for instance, if I were to compare these two models against each other, what would my degrees of freedom for the comparison be? Three. Three. You're right. Why three? Because we have three variances. Yep. Yep. So it's the question of do you need four variances or one variance that you say holds for all four occasions? That's where the three comes from. So in these models, there's basically two kinds of choices. 
should the variances all be the same or all be different? And all be different, by the way, requires balanced data because you'd have to have a finite set that you could possibly allow a separate variance for. And all the same or not is the covariance or correlation pattern. There's one more type of pattern we looked at last time. Do you remember what it is? Starts with a T. Yeah, it's a hard one to say. Topolitz or topolitz, as I con continue to say it. It's like February, right? I only say it correctly when I'm concentrating on it. The rest of the world just says February. Or library is another one. Right? But topolitz, how is this one different than autoregressive? On slide 13, I am. Let me, let, me, let me ask a more specific question. Does this have more parameters or fewer than autoregressive? More. more. It will always have more because it requires for the hetero, or excuse me, homogeneous version of the variance N. So it does increase with the number of occasions. And the idea here is that the covariance between occasions one unit in time apart is held to be the same. That's the C for T1, meaning one distance apart. C for T2 is a whole separate parameter. So it's not squared. They're not tied together. That's why it's N, because basically the diagonal is one, and each off-diagonal is another one all the way through. And then here's the heterogeneous version of it where instead of specifying the model in terms of covariances, it's specified in terms of correlations. Because if the variance is different across time, covariance has to be. And what you get on your output depends on what program you're looking at. So in the, the SAS output, I've been very careful to label what they mean. But one of the key things about all of these choices that we've seen so far is that, let me go back to... This one, I want slide three for a second. All of the choices that we've talked about so far are putting everything into one matrix. So we would, I think of this as like the total amount of variance and covariance put back together again versus what we are going to do today is rely on this idea of between versus within that would allow us to customize these choices so that they refer only to the within person part, which is going to be hopefully more parsimonious. So that's where we're headed today, is a few more choices, but choices that work differently. And let's look back at the example. I opened the PDF this time because I'm done with Word moving my boxes around. I have like six computers, and this is the only one that it does that for, so I have no idea because they all run the same version of Office, but whatever. So do you remember the story behind these data? A friend of mine whose dissertation turned into a longitudinal project we're looking at fluctuation in psoriasis severity, which is a skin condition thought to be exacerbated by stress and other environmental factors. And we're trying to just model the pattern of variance and covariance across these weeks prior to examining prediction by stress or any other covariates that we care about. So we have this as the picture of individual growth trajectories. Notably, most people aren't really changing. They're just kind of bumping around. Here was unstructured. First off is the answer key model we went over. So this is the answer key. Like, this is what the data say. It's meh, eyeballing this. The variances look mostly the same, but they differ a little here and there, and not really a pattern. It's not like they're decreasing or increasing, which would point to a growth curve instead. Uh, correlations are still pretty high, even between the highest lag, the first occasion and the seventh occasion, still has a correlation of 0.8. So then we went through the process of trying out a few of those alternatives. Compound symmetry. So that's the one that allows us to calculate an intraclass correlation for how much is between versus within. First thing we're going to do today is see how to do compound symmetry a different way that's equivalent but has more flexibility to it. In uh, That's CS for compound symmetry and SAS, exchangeable in STATA, and core comp sim in R using the GLS package. That one told us that the average correlation over time is 0.84, which I called an 84% waste of time because 84% of the variance is cross-sectional due to mean differences that she already had in her study in the first leg of it. So the remainder is what the, was the information that was added in terms of doing a longitudinal study. So while the 
likelihood ratio test against an E only model is significant, meaning that that correlation of 0.84 is different than zero, as one might expect. If we did a likelihood ratio test against unstructured, so the fewer is the compound symmetry, the more is the unstructured, the difference in minus two log likelihood is this column right here, deviance difference, 156, definitely worse. Then we did AR, and that one is built into all of the packages as well. It's AR with a one in parentheses, meaning first order. There is also second order or third order possible. AR1 in lowercase in Stata, and AR1 in uppercase in R. So here's a pro tip. If you ever get it to break and you're not sure why, check your capitalization. I've found that several times that I have the wrong case and otherwise everything looks exactly right. And in terms of the predicted R matrix from the AR structure, that's right here for these data. So these are variances and covariances. You can't see the R parameter because it's a correlation though, which is why I asked for R core. And so the R for every occasion that is one apart is the 0.89. That's what it was estimated to be. R squared is 0.8, R cubed is 0.71, R to the fourth is 6.64, and so on. So this makes the last occasion's correlation with the first occasion to be predicted by 0.5, which is way lower than it actually is in the data. So this doesn't fit very well either relative to unstructured. Then we tried our friend Topolitz, and it's TOPE 7 in SAS, but TOPE 6 in STATA because STATA doesn't count the diagonal of variances, but SAS does. And R doesn't have it built in, so I didn't do it in there. And this one is structured in terms of covariances. So 0.72 is for the first off diagonal, one unit in time apart. Then a separately estimated parameter is the 0.69. Another separate parameter is the 0.65 and so on. So this one has seven parameters, which is more than the two, but much less than the 21 that we started with, or 28. And we found a almost not, almost not, not significant. So it is significant, but just barely p-value against unstructured. Trying to make it fit just a little bit better by allowing different variances didn't help. So I've got then that model that changes the diagonal only, and then the topolitz relations are specified in terms of correlations. And this is where we left off. So adding the variance components, that's this part right here, that didn't help. And it actually fits worse than unstructured at the O1 level rather than the O4 level. So we're not, that's not helping. So now it's time for a change of plan. And that's where we start today. All right, questions about any of that? Then I'm switching back to lecture four. And we're starting with this one. Let's see here. So here's some words to help you with what's nested in what. I'm starting on slide 15 with some new vocabulary. So the other way of patterning variance and covariance relies explicitly on this idea that probably a good chunk of the reason that occasions are correlated is because of constant mean differences. So conceptually, the whole idea that we're doing from this point forward is, let's pull that much out and see what's left. That's it. So rather than having one marginal total matrix that we're trying to figure out what pattern it is of all the variance and covariance, we're going to work with two separate matrices. We're gonna take the random intercept variance that is responsible for inducing a constant correlation over time, we're gonna move it to a different place. That new place is going to be called G. So this is the documentation within SAS Mixed. It's also a very common set of letters to deal with these concepts. T is also one that I see commonly. So G or T, you can usually tell on the context which, what it means. So we're taking that random intercept variance that we used to put in the compound symmetry matrix in R and we're moving it someplace else. It's going in G. Then R 
after we factor out that constant source of person mean differences covariance is going to be just the within person part. So now we're back to this idea of level two between person is in G, level one within person is in R. And the question is, how complicated does the residual within person level one R have to be? Like how much is there left over after we control for person mean differences? And what you will see is that we don't have to have as many parameters in it because the person mean differences was responsible for the lion's share of the correlation pattern. So in order to pull that off though, we have some matrices and some letters to attach to that. The bad news, yes, you have to learn the names of all of these things. The good news, you don't have to do any of the matrix operations. At no point am I going to ask you to do this, but it is necessary to show you how it works. But I want you to hang on to just the concept of this idea of partitioning variance. G is level two, R is going to be level one. What's left? When we put them back together again, so when we, we configure the model basically to get back to what the marginal total pattern is, the name for that new place where they get combined is V. So G and R get combined. Welcome to the jungle, folks. It's all about V. For those of you in the SEM class, V is sigma. It's the same. It's literally the exact same set of equations, just with different letters attached, because there's different conventions in different fields. So conceptually, it looks like this. This is slide 16 in lecture four. I have a new place that is going to hold my random intercept variance for mean differences across people. That's my level 2G. That is the random statement in SAS. It is the bar thing in R, and it's bar bar in Stata. So there's that part of the code that's responsible for you telling it what goes into G. We'll see examples of that starting today. And then after you pull that random intercept variance out, the question is what's left in R? So the R matrix now is just the level one, why are you off your line today, within person longitudinal part. And the place where we start, the simplest model we would entertain, is diagonal R that looks like this. So sometimes folks get confused when they see the zeros here because it's like, hey, wait a minute, are you telling me that residuals are uncorrelated? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the residuals are uncorrelated after taking out the random intercept variance. So conditionally unrelated, local independence. When you put it back together again, you get this pattern of V, the combined marginal total structure, and you already know what that's called, right? That's compound symmetry. So for all intents and purposes, this is a semantic distinction that the software makes as to how you tell it you want compound symmetry. You can either say, keep everything in R and just call it compound symmetry, or you can split it into two places, but when you put it back together again, it's the same thing. But the rationale for splitting it up like this is that then we can go into this R matrix and figure out what its pattern needs to be. If there is something left over, how much is it? Is it just the occasions that are one unit apart, or two units apart, three units apart, and so forth? And for those of you who are not fans of matrix multiplication, addition, inverses, and such, my version of this would be, think of like taking this random intercept ver variance and just like stick it, stick it everywhere in this R matrix. Just stick it everywhere. And then you get this. And for those of you that are like, uh, I don't think stick it everywhere is a formal mathematical application that I can tell R to do or Stata or SAS, I'd say, yes, you are. And this is what it actually looks like. So to make the G matrix the right size to be combined back together with R, it gets pre and post multiplied by a vector we call Z. And what this is, is the intercept for each individual person. So this would be somebody who has four occasions of data. The column that would essentially be the predictor variable that is responsible for the intercept would just be a column of ones. So if we take this G matrix here with one thing in it and multiply it by Z and then Z transpose, so it's transpose just shoving it on its side, 
then we can add it to R and we get to V that looks like that. So this Z thing is individual specific, which turns out to be really advantageous because you can stick in whatever occasions a person has to have. They don't have to be the same and they don't have to be complete. So each person is gonna have like their own custom V matrix when this is all said and done. And we just stack all the V matrices together for the, the whole sample and that's what uh, is used in the estimation. Okay, how are we doing so far? Okay, so this is still compound symmetry. It is a different set of instructions to the program as to how to make it. And this different set of instructions allows us flexibility in what we do with R. So this is exactly the same thing as the compound symmetry R only model when you have homogeneous variances. It is the same thing. Which might ask the question then, is there a version of this that goes with unstructured? Can we just like let all these spots in R be what they want and see what it would be? Very close we can, all but one. So this is a model I talk about in chapter four. It is an R matrix that is unstructured almost. So we would allow all of the within person variances and covariances to be whatever they want, except for the one at the highest leg. This one has to be forced to zero or the model won't be identified because you can't have R be everything gets to be what it wants and then have one more thing, right? Because we have the random intercept variance already, we got to shut one of these off. And so when this gets put back together again into V, what ends up happening is that what this model says is that the only reason that occasions that are the furthest distance apart are related at all is just the random intercept. So our job then is to see of this pattern of this R, like what is that going to look like? Is that autoregressive? Is that topolitz? Is that some other kind? And can we get away with something that's simple? So somewhere between zero for all the off diagonals and everything but the last one being estimated is where we're at. Okay, no, one, no one's talking in the chat window. Everyone in class looks like you're calmly digesting all of this. Do you want to see an example of what this is going to look like? I think that will help. Like seeing actual numbers is going to help. Yes, exclamation point. The Zoomers want an example. Well, who am I to disappoint anyone? So I'm on page eight then of example four. So the, uh, as I said earlier, the example that's in the book for chapter four is a different example than this one. So you'll have two full sets of these models to, to look through at your leisure. So at the top of page eight then, we are starting with this G plus UN N minus one model, meaning let's put the random intercept somewhere else and see what's left. So there's some new pieces to the code. In SAS, there is a new line called the random line. And that is what you tell, how you tell SAS what goes in your G matrix. What all parameters do you want each person to have their own of? That's what goes on random. Right now, it's the word intercept. And yes, you have to type that. It's not a default. I'm also asking it to print V and V core, which is the put back together again, marginal variance, covariance matrix and the correlation version. And I'm asking it to print G2 even though there's only one thing, it, thing in it. And then UN6, because I have seven occasions, what that's doing is shutting off the very last off diagonal. It's forcing it to zero. And I'm asking for R and R core as we had before. So the between part of the model is random. The within part of the model is repeated in SAS. In Stata, we have picked up a random intercept right here. Do you see the blank between the word sub ID and the comma? That's random intercept. You just have to know that. It's default. So in our previous models, I had the word no constant there to shut it off, because, but now I want it back. The residuals portion of the state of code then is the within person part of the model. 
And so banded 6 is the same thing as UN6, according to Stata. And I can't figure out how to do this in R. Doesn't mean it can't be done, just means I haven't figured it out yet. So if anyone's looking for, like, you know, a, a project, right? Someone figured this out for me. Then you can write a tutorial about how to do these models in R. I'm not actually kidding. Like, that, there is a place for well-written papers for people who figured out how to trick R or M plus or other packages into doing things. But here's what we have in the results of this model. So here's R matrix. This is now just the within person level one residual variance and covariance over time. So the diagonal is much smaller. What used to be the rest of the diagonal is down here in G, the 0.63. So of the total variance at each occasion, which was roughly 0.8 or so, 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.63 is the contribution due to the random intercept. And then this is telling us how much is the variation of the ease at each point relative to each person's mean? And these are the residual covariances between those E's specifically. It's hard to tell how big they are because they're scaled in the metric of variance. So that's what having an R core matrix is helpful for, this one right here. So eyeballing this, what this is telling me is that occasions that are one unit in time apart looks like their E's are still related around 0.57-ish. It, it's a little smaller for some of them, but 0.5-ish. So yeah, it looks like there is still, however bad your psoriasis was last week, it's related to how bad it is this week after controlling for how bad it usually is. How bad it usually is is over in level 2G between persons. So now we can say, all right, well, what kind of pattern is going to fit this? If I had to guess, I'd say we need lag 1 something, lag 2 something, maybe lag 3 something, but it's not clear. And then the rest is just kind of noise. So this is the reason to, to take this approach of this partitioning. It's because you have more choices about what's left in R. Trying to pattern everything in one matrix is a lot harder. So this will fit exactly well as regular unstructured. And when you put them back together again, so if I take the random intercept variance that was estimated at 0.63 and just like stick it everywhere in here, there's V. And that in the V put back together again is exactly the unstructured R we had before. How we doing? Okay, big picture. Big picture, okay, what we're doing? We're splitting. How much of the variance is due to person mean differences? How much of the covariance is due to person mean differences? Let's put that over in G, level two. R is the E's that are left within person residual variance and covariance. So here are some choices then. So let's do compound symmetry. Again, starting with the simplest and trying to work our way into something more complex. The exact same compound symmetry model is specified with repeated and random in SAS as follows. Random intercept and then repeated weak as usual, but I have type equals BC. So this is a diagonal R. It will look like this. <laughs> So this model says the E variance is constant over time with zero covariance. That's what this model says as a starting point. So type equals VC. This is what you would change to decide what other pattern you want the E variances and covariances to have. Type equals UN though, right here, that will never ever change. Ever in your life. Type equals UN forever and ever. Amen. Now at this point, if you only have a random intercept in your matrix, is that actually a matrix? We would call that a scalar, I think, right? It's a number. So a, a, a matrix that has one thing in it can't possibly have a pattern. Where this matters is when we start having other things be random in here too, like a random time slope. Then we do want it to be unstructured because we want the intercept variance to be whatever it wants. 
We want the slope variance to be whatever it wants, and we want them to be correlated however they want. So when it comes to the random effects that are in your model, there is no patterning that makes sense. Unstructured, the end. And no, that's not a default. It depends on your software. It's not the default in, in SAS. It's not the default in SPSS. Uh, it's not the default in Stata either. So then in Stata, we have the random intercept that's not written here, but is implied. And then the residuals are independent after that. And in R, we are switching. I am still within the NLME package, but I am choosing a different function, which is LME, linear mixed effects. So this example will be just GLS and LME. The next one is going to be LME and LMER which are from two different packages and work differently. LME is the only one that I could find that allows you to have a random intercept and have some kind of level one R structure also that's not diagonal. It's the only way I could figure out how to do it. So we're using LME. The arguments are relatively the same. So data, method, here's my model. It's an empty means model because time is not really relevant in terms of predicting a y severity is worth on some weeks than others. It has a separate argument for what is random. And squiggle one, what's that mean? It's a softball question. What's squiggle one? Random intercept. Yeah. So we have severity squiggle one, that's my fixed intercept. Random equals squiggle one, that's my random intercept. And then random over what? Subjects sub ID, lowercase. And then correlation equals null refers to what do you think? The R matrix? Yeah, that's the R matrix. Yeah, what correlation pattern do you want in there? I don't want any, thank you. And homogeneous variance is the default for R. So LME, I thought I was going to use for everything for this class, but then I figured out real quick that it doesn't do denominator degrees of freedom correctly in some cases. So LMER does, but it doesn't have these three things that are very easy to get. So the get getVerCov function that is an LME in that package allows me to actually print out G, R, and V, the same as in SAS, and LMER does not. I put it on my birthday list. R packages is what I want. But the difference here is the type. So random dot effects means I'd like the G matrix, please. Conditional means I want R. So the conditional in this context means leftover after controlling for between person level two random intercept variance. So R is within persons. And then V, what I call total or put back together again, is called marginal. And individual equals 100 means I just want it printed for the first person, not some ginormous thing that's for everybody. And the ID number that is first in my data set, that the first person to have complete data, I think, is person 100. So this would need to be changed to be data set specific. OK. Then last but not least here, I am asking it to show the intraclass correlation. And within this package, I couldn't find any way to do that. So I did it manually. <laughs> I went into the matrices and told it to add this shit together. Like, so I made it work. Um, and then there is a likelihood ratio test as to whether we need the random intercept at all. And you can use the ANOVA function within the NLME package to do that, just like usual. OK, so any questions on any of that code thus far? So then if you're following along in the R output, you will get to see all of these same matrices printed out. So this is just for more pedagogical purposes. I find it's useful to see what is in each piece and see it added together. But if you don't have this like in your life, it probably won't hurt you. But to make the point that what this compound symmetry model is saying is the same thing it said before, just in pieces. So this part is level one residual variance specifically, no covariance in the model. That's why our core has nothing on the off diagonal. G matrix is just the one number. So 0.68 is the amount of variability 
that is due to person mean differences at level two. Put back together again, my V matrix right here, that's my compound symmetry pattern all over again. Just a different way of getting to the same result. And V core holds my intra-class correlation. So it's 0.682 divided by 0.81. That's where those numbers came from, worked out here. And it's 0.84, same intra-class correlation that it was before. So it's not that the model is saying that there's no relationship over time. It's that there's no more relationship over time after controlling for person mean differences. That's what it's saying. But we already know that compound symmetry doesn't fit very well. So let's try to make it better. Of all of these choices, I would say that this one is the most useful. I like this one the best. Random intercept plus AR1 residual. How many parameters is this going to be? How many was AR before? Remember? Two. And if I add a random intercept in a separate place, three. And it's three regardless of however many occasions you have. And you can change it so that it doesn't require equal interval data. So within SAS, there's an, another type that where you can specify exact time that's non-equal interval. Um, I couldn't find it in STATA, but I did find it in R as core car one. So that's for unbalanced time. So to me, this one is pretty useful. It's only three parameters. It works for basically any kind of data. And it's reasonable. Because what this is saying is that, okay, some people are higher than others on average, cool. And after that, occasions that are closer together are more related. Like, that, that seems pretty reasonable. So we have our random intercept plus our type equals AR1 for R. And we can do the same thing in STATA with the residuals command. And it is built into the LME as core AR1. And then the rest of this. <laughs> it needed to, to make that work. So it's a correlation of just the conditional part, just the level one residuals, because you have this random also being activated right here. So I asked it to print G, R, and then I also built an R core matrix and asked it to print that. And then I asked it to print V. And then I have two likelihood ratio tests here. Because there's two questions that we can ask about this model. One concerns the utility of the random intercept, and the other is, is this good enough yet relative to unstructured? So we'll see the results for both of those. And I did those using the macro in SAS as well, and in STATA you can do the same likelihood ratio test in LR test. So let's see what happened. Here's my new R matrix. So this is an AR pattern, which says constant variance on the diagonal, and it says the covariance across time is this 0.08. The R parameter is in correlation form in the next matrix, and that's the 0.5. So the three parameters that are in total for this, random intercept variance in G, person mean differences variance, residual variance, E level one variance on the diagonal of R, and then the correlation in R that gets squared, cubed, fourth, fifth, and so forth, the 0.5. So now it's predicting that occasions that are one unit in time apart are related, correlated 0.5. Their E's are correlated 0.5 specifically. 0.5 squared is 0 0.26. 0 0.5 to the third power is 0.13, and so forth. So the three actual parameters that it estimates to build all of this are right here. The matrices just show how they get used to make a prediction, to make a model implied matrix. Model implied, recreated, predicted, all of those words mean the same thing to me in this context. Okay, so relative to our original data, here's the V put back together again version. It looks pretty good. I don't know if it's good enough without doing the stats, but it looks pretty good to me. Survey says, two questions are relevant. First, is it useful to have a random intercept? 
So that's AR versus AR with a random intercept. And the difference in those two models is one degree of freedom for adding that random intercept variance. The difference in minus two log likelihood is 47 and a p-value that is 0 to 12 decimal places. So yeah, definitely. So conceptually, what does that mean, do you think? If I'm telling you that a random intercept variance makes my AR model better, this one's a little bit hard to think about. The AR-only model, without the random intercept, says that marginally, the correlation pattern is this, then squared, then third, then fourth. This one says conditionally that's the correlation pattern. Any ideas? A little tricky one. In this case, it boils down to, is, is, are we talking about an AR pattern for the outcome or an AR pattern for the residuals at level one specifically? And if the latter fits better, then that means only the E's have an autoregressive pattern to them, not the total. Lisa, could you say, like give an example, like real world or like ap application style description, if you know what I mean? Uh, what, what I would say is that it's two different ways of, of viewing a data set. And, and it boils down to what kind of correlation pattern do you expect for occasions that are far apart in time? Far apart in time, according to this model, the relationship is two things. It's the decay of the residual correlation plus that constant correlation from person mean differences. So the V matrix that this model predicts, this one right here, like even weeks one and seven are still correlated 0.8. Whereas in the straight, unrandom intercept version of the AR, our only model, that was, di that was predicted to go all the way down to 0.5. So to me, what this is saying is that only the residuals at level one within persons have an AR structure to them, not the overall data. And yeah, that, that's about as, as example-y as I can get. I'm sorry. This is, this is very abstract stuff. But the reason no, we care is, is to make sure that we have all this part right before we put in the predictors we do care about. That's why we yeah, care. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense what you said. Yeah, this I is, know. remember, we're taping the ceiling, we're taking off the light fixtures, we're patching the holes, we're doing all the boring part before we start painting the room. That's what this is. So the idea that adding a random intercept helps is giving us evidence that we're heading in the right direction, basically, that doing this partitioning, saying at least some of the relationship across occasions is because of mean differences, and then we're focusing on what's left. Is it good enough yet? That's the second likelihood ratio test here. What do we think? Worse. Yeah, not good enough yet. This is worse than unstructured a difference of 25 parameters because unstructured has 28 and this one has three. But the difference is only 50, which is, is really not a lot considering you, you left out 25 things. So that's why I like this one. I think it has promise. And all the software packages can do it. Unlike this one, which is Toplitz. So Toplitz also works with the idea of a lag for the residual correlation but it doesn't specify that the lag is squared, cubed, and fourth. They're just separate. So we can fit Topolitz 6 because we have to make the last covariance or correlation 0, which is called Topolitz 5 in Stata, and it's not available in our LME either. And that one would look like this. So again, E variance, constant over time. This is what the model says the covariance would be between occasions one unit apart is only 0.07. Two units apart is 0.04. If we put that in terms of correlation pattern, we got one unit apart is correlated 0.45, so similar to what the AR model suggested. The difference, though, is that the rest of them are separate. They're not squared or cubed. They're just separate parameters. So we have 0.26 
that's two units apart, that's probably still significant. Then we get into like, you know, the crap left over and even negative. So there's basically a dividing line here where it looks like weeks one apart, yeah, the E's are correlated. Two apart, still correlated. Three apart, nah, not so much. Put back together again, here's my marginal V matrix. Here's the correlation version. Looks pretty good to, to my eye. Here are all of the individual parameters that predict the covariance at each of these lags. And for this one, you probably could use the p-values, but I'd still prefer likelihood ratio tests. I say probably because the covariances are, are not bounded at zero. They can be negative. So then we can see, do we really need these ones that are not significant, or can we get rid of them? So I did that process. I tested sequential models where I took out the last second to last lag, then the next one, then the next one, and tracked the change in minus two log likelihood AIC and BIC, and it looked like this one, based on just the fit. So that's where I ended up. Tope four, meaning one diagonal of residual variances, three lagged relationships, only cope three in Stata because they only count the lagged relationships. And this is what it turned out to be. So we've got equal variance over time here. And then we've got the off diagonals. So occasions one apart have a covariance of 0.08. That becomes 0.5 if we talk about it in terms of correlation. Occasions two apart have a correlation of 0.34. And occasions three apart have a tiny correlation of 0.11, but it was enough to make us keep it. And when we add this random intercept variance to everywhere in this matrix, then we end up with this as the, the pattern. So I want to draw your attention to these last elements right here. See if I can highlight more than one of them at a time. They're all the same. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence. They're this number. Coincidence or consequence? Consequence, yeah. What we're saying is that after three units of time apart, the only reason those E's would be related is because of the random intercept, and that's it. So this is also, to me, a fairly reasonable model. However, if you have unequal intervals, then this doesn't make any sense. This is weekly data, so it makes sense to think of the relationship between 1 and 2 as being the same as 2 and 3 as being the same as 3 and 4. But that would not make sense if they were all measured at different intervals. All right, how are we doing? Question? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did all the possibilities just sort of for you know, demonstration purposes, but yeah, I'd probably skip straight to that one. And then you can see if like the one above or one below, like you can kind of find that sweet spot as to where you have enough, but not too many. Um, in general, it's, it's not a problem to have extra, but it can hurt your power. Like the more things you're trying to estimate, the, um, the larger your standard errors are going to be. So you want to try to get away with as few parameters as possible. But the other part of this is that we're working with an empty model. We don't know how these conclusions would change after we put in X, Y, Z predictors that we care about. And so then you might want to kind of revisit, like, do I still need just three lags or can I get away with two now? Like that kind of thing. So it's important to start with a plausible model so that you can trust the standard errors and p-values of the fixed slopes that you care about, but then you kind of have to reevaluate after you're all the way done if this is still uh, a good enough model. Other questions? So then the good enough part. I have, uh, did I put it in there? Yeah, I think that's at the end. 
So one last thing that I checked is whether the variances need to be heterogeneous. And I could only figure out how to do this in SASNA. The other packages had that option programmed in. So I went ahead and allowed this di diagonal of variances to all be different. And then we do our friend likelihood ratio test to see if that helped. So here's the put back together again. That's now heterogeneous over time. So there's two likelihood ratio tests then. First, did the heterogeneous variances help? Yeah, it looks like they did. So that's interesting because last time they didn't. So what this is telling me is that the residual variances specifically look to be heterogeneous, but the marginal variances do not. Because most of them is that random intercept. Like it's, it's like hogging all the, the space. And what about this result right here? Chi-square of about 17 on 17 degrees of freedom versus unstructured. P-value is decidedly non-significant. Good news or bad news? Good news. So this is a different idea than we're used to thinking about. Yay, non-significance, said no one ever, but yay. Because this means that our model is good enough. It is not worse, not significantly worse than unstructured, and we saved 17 parameters in building it. So how many parameters are in this model? <laughs> we'll count them up. All of these. So we got a random intercept variance in G, person mean differences. Then we have seven, seven, severin, I'm going to make up some words today, seven separate residual variances. And then I've got three lagged correlations, one unit in time apart, two units in time, or three units in time. So not terribly parsimonious, but much better than unstructured. And I'm on page, what, of this handout? This is the last page, 17. And if I were to write this up in a, in a real manuscript, like paper, this is all I would say. Because nobody cares. No one cares except you. So if you wanted to be super diligent, you could put up supplemental material, like you could put that up on OSF or at the journal's website that has like all the model comparisons, but no one cares. So I would just say some blanket statement like, we tried to find a model that was not worse, and look, we found one, and that's what we're going to use for the rest of the analyses. And that's the story. Okay. So then we can do, here's what it looks like without numbers in notation. So I have all of the different combinations that we looked at here. Random intercept plus autoregressive first order, heterogeneous version of that. All the topolitzes, topoli? That seems like it should be a word that's topoli. Like, like syllabi, you know, topoli and all of those. And then we get to this thing on slide 24, which I'm going to put up because this thing took me like two days of my life to make. It, it was a really hard task to figure out how to lay this out to show all the nesting, but I, I have something that I think works, and so I'm going to make it work here. So this is from, uh, this is figure 4.1 in chapter 4. So I've got a, the, the dividing line here is whether the variances are homogeneous or heterogeneous across time, and then I have the R-only models versus the GNR models. So GNR means a separate random intercept variance in the level 2G matrix. And what's nested in what, basically? So compound symmetry, R only, is the same thing as just a random intercept with a diagonal R matrix. You can talk about first order autoregressive as another two parameter model. So the number of parameters is here on the left. And that is nested within the version that contains a random intercept. Likewise, um, Anything that has some kind of correlation pattern is nested, or the one that doesn't have any correlation is nested in it, and getting all the way up to uh, the number of uh, possible occasions in terms of the number of lag covariances minus one, if you don't have a random intercept, and minus two if you do, and then here's all of the versions for the heterogeneous side. Um, and then here's some stuff to watch out for. So here's one that I occasionally see people screw up. Uh, if I have an, a random intercept, I cannot have a compound symmetry R matrix. It 
it's not identified. So if, let's think about why that would be. Compound symmetry R matrix is, is intercept variance plus residual, right? I can't have intercept variance in G and more intercept variance in residual in R. It's redundant. So if you try, SAS or whatever program will, will zero out one of the parameters and be like, you can't do this. I'll give you some dots where that one should have been. The other ones you will find out if it's not possible because the model won't converge or you'll get dots. Dots means something went wrong if you don't get all the parameters you asked for. Um, let's see. Yeah. So more words about how to specify various things and random and repeated. So what gets tricky about these models is trying to figure out what they mean in terms of what the total variances in R. If you're using a random intercept in the G matrix, R is within only. If you're not, then R and V are the same thing. So in terms of stuff that you can be working on for class, what's due next, Monday night, is your next formative assessment. So just like before, answer the questions as best you can. We'll go over them in class. And then what's due the following week, so about 10 days from now or so, is your first homework. And that is not a data analysis. I give you a bunch of minus 2 log likelihood values and some words describing the models. And you're supposed to figure out how to compute AIC and BIC. You go back to that slide 7, I think it is, where they are, using these formulas. So as I said before, the point of homework is not the math. The point is for you to recognize the vocabulary and how many parameters that must be given however many occasions are in your problem. And also to practice doing uh, likelihood ratio tests as well as learning when those are, will work and when those won't work. So one of the things that I didn't get a chance to uh, highlight, let me open up the end of lecture three real quick here because this will be relevant. Pick up where I left off. It's probably about there. Yeah. Okay. This table right here on slide 30 of lecture 3 you will, will be helpful to refer to homework. So there are several questions on it that say something like, which of these is going to give you a valid likelihood ratio test? And the ones, the answers that are wrong are wrong in either one or two ways. One of the things I'm looking for is this rule right here, that if you are in REML, you cannot compare differences between models that have different fixed effects. In REML, you cannot. The reason for that is because what REML is focusing on are the residuals, and it's trying to maximize the likelihood of the residuals. Well, residuals are after accounting for fixed effects. So they're on different mathematical scales, and you can't compare the minus 2 log likelihood on different scales. So some of the answers are wrong because it will say something like empty means versus saturated means in REML. That's wrong. You can't do that. The other ones are going to be wrong because of the order. Let me see if I can find, yeah, this one. Fewer minus more. In order for the test statistic to be positive, the minus two log likelihood that goes with the simpler model must come first. So if I had something like unstructured minus compound symmetry, is that okay or not okay? Unstructured minus compound symmetry, would that work? No, it would not, it's backwards. So I'm, I'm telling you what I'm looking for here, and I'm not trying to be completely transparent. Otherwise, it's figuring out, okay, if it's heterogeneous, instead of homogeneous variants, how many parameters does that add? I can tell you the answer, n minus 1. Because it's always one variance versus all the variances. So all the variances means one per occasion. The one left over is the one that you would have if you constrained them equal. Um... Yeah, so those are the things that you can be working on. Where we are headed next week, I'm, I do have the lecture ready. I don't have the example ready to go with it. Next week is random slopes. So we're starting to head over onto the change side. 
first just getting the idea of what fixed versus random is, because that, that's a thing. And then seeing some of the math, like this sort of a little bit scary stuff about how a random slope model is actually a V pattern. It is. It's another set of choices when you invoke a random slope for change over time, and it makes a funky pattern like this. But it does so in a different way. So after that, that's next week and probably two weeks worth of material, then we start talking about kinds of change. So if it's not linear, what are your other choices? If it's not linear, it's some kind of bendy, right? Is it bendy that goes up and comes back down? Is it bendy that levels off? Is it bendy where it looks like it's broken into two pieces? Lots of different choices for that. So that will take like the next two months or something. That's where we're headed. All right, I'm not going to belabor the rest of this because you can read it, and it's my birthday, and I don't want to. So, <laughs> fair, right? Okay, any questions or things that you want to hear more about before we call it a day? None from the rumors, Zoomers? No, they're all quiet too. All right, then I will say thanks for being here. Have a great weekend. Let me know if you need anything. And work on your formative assignment. Assessment. Bye, everybody.